Yes, that's uh, correct. I think I can state that uh, the bridge project really has been transformative in our lab's uh, research, and as well as uh, not, I can't say because we work on hard diseases. Uh, the first one was GBM that uh, you know we've found immediate cures or anything like that, but we're very hopeful that uh, progress is being made, and it's been pretty exciting to be a part of the program. So I'm, I'm very excited to see the uh, support for pediatric gliomas, because it turns out we actually work on both adult and pediatric gliomas uh, in my laboratory and in my uh, clinical practice as a neuropathologist. And I think what I'd like to do is, uh, following that great talk uh, uh, by Joran and, uh, and the clinical group, is to, to kind of go through some of the opportunities that you might have and show a little bit more of the uh, tumors and some of the biology that's associated with them. So uh, you've seen this before from the prior talk, and I think really the main emphasis point is that gliomas uh, are... Uh, a high percentage of these uh, brain tumors overall, over 60%. And of those, the low grades predominate, but they're uh, both uh, very significant uh, percentages of low and high grade. And for the low grade tumors uh, split out here, you see that there are a number of different tumor types. And I think that's one thing that uh, if you're new to this area or field uh, is kind of challenging as the pathologists have created, uh, I haven't calculated, but some untold tens to 20 different histological subtypes, uh, and then now the molecular has complicated that even more. So that shouldn't be daunting to you. I think it makes it kind of exciting. There's an underlying biology that leads to that, uh, but it, it does mean that you want to be informed as far as exactly what type of tumor and drivers you're going to study in a biological uh, setting. And uh, one sort of overall point is that uh, for the malignant tumors, at least, uh, this really is an important disease to fund and study in that uh, the brain tumors are now one of the more, uh, the most common tumor, even compared to leukemia as far as uh, mortality goes. So we're not dealing uh, with a problem that is a light one. Uh, and, you know, even though the, there's a lot of patients that do well, there's also a lot of patients that really need very significant amounts of research dedicated towards them. So pilocytic astrocytoma is uh, one of the most common uh, low-grade gliomas. Um, and I just wanted to clarify some of the terminology because it's a little confusing, and that is that uh, we'll interchange terms like glioma or astrocytoma throughout the day. Uh, glioma is kind of a broader term for all the different types of tumors that were thought to have relationship uh, to different uh, glial cells within the brain whereas astrocytoma was thought to be a little more specific uh, towards that astrocytic lineage. Uh, but really, for the purposes of studying these and designing projects, glioma and astrocytoma are equivalent uh, in many ways. About 30% of the patients uh, have this type of tumor uh, within pediatric CNS tumors, and the majority of them have this 3' uh, BRAF duplication event, uh, which activates the BRAF kinase, uh, in a slightly different way, as you'll hear from Chuck Stiles later, from the BRAF V600E uh, point mutation. And uh, there are various subtypes, and they have a different pattern of effect, but most of them have this kind of similar biology, which is you have a tumor shown up here, uh, which has more of a solid growth pattern and pushes and compresses portions of the children's brain. So here's a little bit of the cerebellum, where they most commonly occur and kind of collapse those regions. So they can intermix with the brain, but they're mostly a solid tumor. And because they're low grade, they have a very uh, low proliferation rate. So uh, that markers like MIB1 uh, have a rate of like less than 5% of cells are actually cycling in those tumors. Um, this is a diagram just to explain a little bit about the morphology and the cytology of those cells. Uh, and if you're a Latin aficionado, it comes uh, the name comes from the fact that these are very hair-like cells uh, present within the tumor, kind of an interesting point. Um, and uh, they have this interesting kind of uh, heterogeneity. So what you're seeing is a region over here of a pilocytic astrocytoma uh, that is very compact and condensed and has more astrocytic features. And then over here you have in the same tumor oligodendroglial-like lineage cells. And so this biphasic appearance is what uh, pathologists uh, sometimes use to identify them histologically. So heterogeneity is a feature of many of the tumors, but particularly astrocytoma. Um, the BRAF duplication event is something that uh, is very useful in identifying these tumors. And so in the past, we didn't have any genomic uh, ways to sort of uh, identify 
patients and subclassify them. Uh, this was one of the first events that really started off the chain of uh, different genomics that were just described in the last talk. Uh, and this really is critical because uh, it was the first tumor where BRAF was involved and it was known that MAP kinase signaling uh, was going to be heavily activated in these tumors. It turns out that MAP kinase is one of the dominant pathways for multiple mutation types and many of the low-grade tumors uh, that you're going to hear about today. Uh, we have a lot of sophisticated ways to diagnose this um, as far as uh, in the clinical realm, and some of them developed here by our group and others was using a ray CGH even on patient samples whereby the duplication event is able to be recognized as giving rise to a fusion between BRAF and a gene that has mostly an unknown function, KAA 1549. And so we can routinely identify these patients uh, quite well now uh, going forward. Uh, other genetic events in the low-grade gliomas like pilocytics or other related tumors that are actually druggable and of interest for planning and projects are NTRAC2 and FGF receptor 1. Uh, these both have uh, very active drug development programs, and so uh, this is a tumor type where there's a lot of excitement to try and develop trials around these different agents. Uh, BRAF E600E uh, is most relevant to uh, low-grade gliomas with a, what we call a glioneuronal or ganglioglioma type or PXA type uh, histology. And uh, although it was mentioned before, oftentimes this is associated in early stages with a very uh, good prognosis tumor. It has been recognized recently that uh, these tumors can progress. And so these patients, if they acquire CDKN2A loss, for instance, a tumor suppressor gene, uh, their survival starts to uh, uh, go down with transformation into mutant high-grade tumors uh, very significantly. So V600E has a lot of uh, utility as a diagnostic as well as a a prognostic marker and a treatment marker in both low and high-grade gliomas. The diffuse astrocytomas uh, uh, here shown as an example of one, uh, which is a WHO grade 2 astrocytoma, a low-grade tumor. Uh, we call them diffuse because unlike the pilocytic astrocytoma, what you see is little tumor cells scattered about and invading throughout the brain in the normal structures and surrounding things that are normally supposed to be there, like a neuron shown here in the middle of the image. And so uh, surgically, you can't resect these quite as well, and so it requires more medical treatment, and that's why the targeted therapies are so exciting is to try and develop agents that can not uh, you know, damage the intervening brain that's uh, present within these tumors. Uh, these low-grade tumors also, again, have very low proliferation rates. Um, this causes some uh, challenges, as we've often encountered in design of studies and that you have to think about the fact that what you're studying is not growing very fast and so models and things like this a little more challenging to develop out of these types of tumors just because they're very slow growing. High-grade gliomas, uh, DIPG is one that we've studied a lot and had a lot of interest in um, and it is, uh, while not common, one of the more high-profile high-grade tumors as was mentioned before. <clears throat> Luckily it's not very uh, frequent but it, it does have this diffuse infiltrative property, as the name might imply. And uh, previously, it was not possible to study very much uh, the tissue or actually native biology of this tumor. That's been a landmark change, which is very helpful for a group like this, which is that uh, clinical trials, both in France and, and here, uh, particularly led by Mark Kieran uh, in Boston, has been that uh, we now can routinely and more confidently biopsy these patients while they're alive and study their tumor and try to uh, respond to that uh, as we go forward uh, for individual patients and also to learn from uh, those patients. Um, the pathology is a little variable in this. We talk about grades. The grading in pediatric gliomas does not have the same implications it does in adults, and so uh, it's not quite as important, I would say. Um, but it, and, and this tumor kind of demonstrates that on biopsy and at early stages of the disease. It can be anywhere from a low grade, grade two, to a grade four. Um, but that doesn't really change the biology. It's just the stages of progression that are ongoing in the tumor with time, uh, as far as we know at this point. Uh, this is an image uh, shown of a, of a brain stem that's been involved by uh, this in a patient. And what you see over here is that uh, the tumor has expanded the normal structure of the pons, where these tumors uh, almost exclusively occur. And again, like for that diffuse astrocytoma, 
uh, you see that uh, the tumor cells in the DIPG are spread throughout and invading structures that are normally there in the brainstem like a blood vessel. And again, very hard to uh, surgically resect, uh, but now possible to biopsy. Uh, pediatric high leg granulomas of another types are the uh, anaplastic astro and the GBMs. Uh, these are the two that are most commonly seen, um, and those have, as before, a little bit uh, better survival maybe than the DIPG, but not uh, uniformly so. Uh, they have more overlap, uh, I would say, with the histology of high-grade adult tumors uh, and GBM, if you've seen those and been involved in research with those before. Uh, and that they have this vascular proliferation, which is an interesting sort of biologic and scientific problem of uh, the interaction tumor with vessels. They have necrosis, which helps define them as a high-grade tumor. And in contrast to the low-grade, the proliferation rate is uh, out of sight in these tumors typically, and uh, they have some astrocytic markers that can help to identify them like GFAP. But the most interesting advance has been in the genetics in these uh, particular tumor types. And this has just been in the last few years. And uh, really, as was said before, it's these histone mutations and their specific flavors and variants that people are trying to figure out right now, how they relate to the disease and the biology. Uh, there is a temporal progression as well as a location progression within the brain uh, for these different uh, mutations, the K27M and the G34R, uh, as well as ACVR1 uh, and other things. And so, uh, there, these are really interesting areas, I think, going forward and how they might interact with more common mutations seen in GBM patients in the adult uh, that we were more familiar with uh, is a really interesting area. Uh, it, it is important uh, that there is commonality between adult and pediatric tumors, even though we focus a lot on the unique mutations, uh, the PEDS, and this has been a really important thing from a diagnostic standpoint and that you can't assume what the tumor is going to have based on the age of the patient uh, really much at all. There are uh, many patients over the age of 20 who start, are starting to be recognized to have the histone mutations, and there are many patients under the age of 21, say, who have the IDH mutations, uh, as was mentioned before, and so uh, really you have to pay attention. You really required both do research and clinically work on these patients uh, sort of program and, uh, that enables you to sort of characterize them genomically and know exactly what the disease is a little more precisely than it was before. So I think that's going to cause major advances in uh, the research. It was hindered before because we lumped everything together, and now we have a great deal of progress in that. And, uh, and that's come through uh, infrastructure improvements for pediatric uh, brain tumors uh, all across the country. I just highlight here that at our program, uh, people in the room will have a great benefit in that we've had a lot of activity uh, at all the different hospitals, uh, MGH, Dana-Farber, um, Boston Children's, um, and uh, pediatrics before. And so uh, we've done a lot of work to develop both tissue acquisition and consenting of patients as an infrastructure that's hardwired for our patients in the system. And uh, our neurosurgery teams, uh, like Lily Gumnarova, who I see sitting in the front row, are actively involved in helping us to get those specimens and uh, trying to make sure that patients are able to participate in this research. The pathology teams are activated for this. And really, the leveraging of this tissue resource is something that I think for bridge projects uh, in the past has been critical and is really well established here, both for uh, looking at genomics uh, as well as for live cell models, which is something I know that many of the engineering projects and devices and technologies and science really uh, depend upon. So I think for pediatric gliomas, we are in a really good uh, position uh, to try and uh, work together to try and do this. And again, I think one important point that people might not realize is that this infrastructure, both the consenting and protocols, <clears throat> as well as numerous uh, grants like SPORs, PO1s, are joint across all the different Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center institutions. Uh, I know that's not always the case, but uh, we've been, uh, it's a very important disease, and so we've all been collaborating very closely on these uh, different aspects of tumors. Um, and what's the success of that? Well, you know, we, we, they are a rare disease, so and that makes it really important to capture every patient. And so uh, this just shows some of the statistics from one of our main uh, protocols for consented research, which is really important uh, for this program. 
And that is that uh, for pediatrics, we have now nearly 1,000 patients who have agreed to participate in research of all different types and kinds, including uh, sequencing, uh, which in the past was not the case, and storage of samples and frozen tissue has really uh, been changing quite a bit and benefiting many of our projects. Uh, in addition, this uh, samples and patients are profiled a level uh, sort of automatically in the background uh, that has not been done in the past. And so uh, this also really enables the research uh, to be moving forward and the money that's uh, coming into the program uh, for maybe the bridge to not be spent on uh, just pure genomics types research. There might be certain projects that need that, but the uh, there's a lot of basic annotation of patients, both with next generation sequencing as well as copy number. And uh, again, the idea is that every patient sample and every patient uh, has this available to them. So all of these assays are actually now in the clinical laboratory as CLIA test and able to be used both in uh, basic research as well as clinical trials research, which is really uh, an important advance uh, to go back and forth between those domains. And there's been improvements and uh, recent advances at all sites in trying to provide this data in an organized format. I know the Dana-Farber has invested heavily in a local C-Bio portal whereby all this information is combined with clinical information and making it more readily accessible to people performing projects and research. And this is something uh, that I think is going to be critical going forward for advances. We, we've benefited greatly along with uh, Chuck Stiles, uh, Ramin Barokam, and the uh, Pediatric Low-Grade Astrocytoma Foundation has helped us to really uh, use these tools as an example uh, for low-grade gliomas and bring together other institutions. And so we've studied a number of different low-grade gliomas in a genomic uh, discovery project uh, whereby we had 13 institutions all centrally bringing in uh, samples so that we can study rare tumor types. Um, and apply genomic sequencing even beyond what's available for clinical genomics. And so all of this infrastructure uh, was able to help this project uh, very early on. Um, one thing that's really important is the ability to create models from uh, pediatric gliomas. Uh, this is not because of their infrequency. Uh, they're a little bit harder to get a large cohort, but we've had a a good success at both adult uh, and pediatrics combined, creating a cohort of about 100 GBM patients now, represented by cell lines and xenografts. And uh, for these, we've done a lot of validation uh, in our programs to show that uh, both phenotypically, uh, for things like stem cell features present in these tumors normally, as well as things like uh, genomic uh, copy number events and expression are well-preserved and validated within these models. Uh, and so these are a great platform for people to study, and we're constantly building and, uh, and uh, contributing and pooling our resources across the hospitals to try and improve uh, the situation. Whoops. Almost got to the end. Don't send. Uh, let's see. And so uh, this is an example of the cohorts that we have right now, uh, collaborating with multiple people at MGH and uh, Stanford and several other institutions. We've pooled resources of cell lines, both patient-derived cell lines as well as patient-derived xenografts. And we now have cohorts that are very tractable uh, for, and published for studying uh, things like PDGFRA amplified patients as well as histone DIPG mutant patients. And so again, um, you know, the resources available I, I think are really important uh, because it helps to make the research uh, advance that much faster. Um, and the low grades, I just want to point out a few points if you're designing teams and projects. The low grades, again, really uh, you're going to be restricted to fresh cells maybe from patients, which we've done a lot of work with and facilitated a lot of uh, people getting access to. Um, and mouse models are really important uh, because they do not grow uh, that well in culture or in mice, so we have no models of low grade before you uh, write and ask. But for high grade, this is um, really the area of focus is models as well as patient samples. And uh, the models that we have, I think, uh, really... Uh, what can you do with them? Well, they, you know, most people are aware that screens are really important for advancing science these days. 
Um, the pediatric uh, GBMs and high-grade tumors, uh, like the adult tumors, are able to be put into screens. And so uh, we've had a cohort of 35 GBM uh, patient-derived cell lines. Uh, as example, including some pediatric tumors, which we've been able to place into a cell titer glow assay developed at the Broad for looking at radiation uh, resistance across patient uh, models. And uh, this has been something I think uh, I'll just highlight that we've been working with Koch investigators already, like Fred Lamb, who's going to speak later on, who uh, was a great collaborator on this project. Um, and so uh, this helped us to discover that, you know, and formally show that uh, sensitive models lack p53 mutations, whereas those that are resistant uh, really have an enrichment for uh, p53 mutations, which are significant. And uh, studying the biology, this now is not ongoing, and how to target and get around that for different patients with similar diseases. And so uh, I'll just end there and say there's just, again, there's a nice infrastructure for people to tap into and in different teams and um, room for new teams uh, to come in. And we're just thankful for all the support we've had over the years from different uh, foundations, uh, as well as in the future from this program. Thank you. Thank you.